that takes us to the slides that uh, that David basically just showed you. Uh, but, uh, but one of the cool features here, Vinny, if you could turn that horizontal, you can see that we can magnify what's on that screen. Uh, so that will actually make it much easier to read through, much easier to look at some of the recommendations that you have available to you. Uh, while I think that the flowcharts provide a, a fairly straightforward approach, uh, more information is obviously needed to optimize care. Uh, so let's go back to the, uh, to the main screen again, Dave, uh, Vinny. Uh, and let's click on the model. If you do that, that brings up the seven severity domains that I'd mentioned before. And once again, if you need to magnify this, all you have to do is, uh, is switch it to the horizontal position, which will allow us to get a bigger view of this, magnifies the view. Dave, could you, uh, Vinny, could you do that? That's great. Uh, the one area that I would like to talk about just a little bit on this screen is the spirometry gauges, uh, because they are slightly different than other grading systems that you may have seen. We've included a spirometry grade zero, which is normal spirometry, and spirometry grade U, which is the undefined group that we used to view as restrictive disease. Uh, but information from a number of recent large studies, including COPD gene, has shown us that folks without clear obstruction on spirometry can have evidence of emphysema and or airway disease on CT scanning. And it therefore seems clear that normal or restricted spirometry does not rule out the presence of emphysema or chronic bronchitis or asthma or the risk of developing either exacerbations or COPD. And having this there at least raises that concept. We've also stressed on these gauges the potential importance of an FEV1 of 60%. The consensus statement from ACP, ACCP, ATS, and ERS several years ago stressed that there was clear data that in those with an FEV1 less than 60%, available medications have an impact for so-called significant COPD. In those with an FEV1 greater than that, the impact is less clear. The model, if you could run down a little bit on this, uh, Vinny, the model also provides some bullet points that combined with the flow chart can provide additional therapeutic options. For example, in those who continue to exacerbate despite maximal inhaler therapy, consideration of adding either refumalast and or macrolides to try to further decrease exacerbation burden. Another bullet point touches on the recent argument re-down-regulating therapy suggesting that at least in some of those who are well controlled on an inhaler regimen, that one consider reducing from a triple to a lama lava with careful follow-up, especially if there's a history of recurrent pneumonias or osteoporosis or cataracts. Other bullet points highlight the need to check for oxygen requirements or evaluate the presence of emphysema, especially now that we have a valve option uh, for lung volume reduction that has recently been approved by the FDA and the need to review screening CT scans for findings other than nodules, looking for findings of pulmonary fibrosis or, uh, or uh, coronary calcifications, uh, or indeed the presence of emphysema or, or chronic bronchitic changes. Let's go back to the home page, Vinny, if you don't mind. We believe that one of the most important components of the app uh, is the inhaler education component. Let's click on that for a moment. We all know that there are multiple devices available. If patients don't use those directly, those, direct, those devices correctly, any potential benefits are lost. This has become even more complicated as the decisions re what medicine is allowed have shifted from providers to insurance carriers who decide based upon what's in their formularies. As you can see, we have videos of all the available devices. Uh, and all you would have to do is click on those. The video will play. You can share it with your, with your patient uh, either on your phone uh, or an, uh, an, an iPad, for example, uh, and explain to them in detail about how this is best to use. Now, I would stress, as you guys all know, that lots of studies have suggested that showing patients how to use these devices is not enough, that the teach-back component is critical. You need to, they need to show you that they know how to use them. Uh, I believe, especially in an era where there are so many of these devices, that having something like this on your, uh, available so easily is a real plus. Uh, go back to the home page again for me, Vin. Uh, let's look at the medications. We've we have a listing here of all the FDA-approved medications. 
and they used it can toggle between generic names of the medicines, as you've seen here, to brand names of the medications. So you'll have access to either of those options. They provide the uh, they provide you with the dosing available and uh, and the number of times a day that they need to be used. And as I said, you can go back and forth from the generic to the brand names. One of the real advantages of the new app is it will allow us to add medications as soon as the FDA approves the medication, rather than going through the time and expense of printing out new versions of the cards. Back to the home page, if you don't mind, Ben. All right, let's take a quick look at the exacerbation box. Uh, this gives us some definitions of uh, what an exacerbation is, what we generally view a moderate or severe exacerbation is, uh, those who are at higher risk, and gives us some suggestions about, uh, about therapy, uh, whether those involve antibiotics or steroids. And, you know, I think that, it, that one of the more important recommendations here is that evidence seems clear that the only role of systemic steroids in this disease is for a short course during an exacerbation. Let's go back to the home screen because the component of the app which has generated the most interest is the new interactive component. If the user completes either the CAT or the MMRC, the user is taken to an exacerbation screen and then to a spirometry screen. If all three of those screens are completed, then they are taken to an interactive chart highlighting therapeutic options. Vinny, let's show them how that works. Let's go to the CAT scan, the CAT uh, uh, for a moment. Let's click number one for all of those options. For those of you who haven't worked with the CAT, the CAT has been validated in multiple different languages. It's really a remarkably simple tool. And as David commented upon, it gives you more than breathing information. It gives you information about sleep and fatigue and energy and all the things which are important in life. So if we look at what we've got here with the CAT, you've got a score of eight. As most of you guys know who've used the CAT, the scores of 10 or more are important. So this is, this is a less than significant. Let's go to the next slide, click the next button. It gives us to the exacerbation screen. Let's click no for both of those. We then go to the uh, to the spirometry screen, which is the next one. Uh, let's put in, for fun, let's put in 70 for vital capacity, 75, 70 for FEV1, and 85 for the ratio. And let's take us then to the next screen. So now you see we're on a screen which will highlight things. So this has highlighted what this is. By spirometry, this is SGU. This is the undefined uh, 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 number that we talked about before. Uh, if you take us down a little further onto this screen, Ben, you'll see that there's an interactive chart. In this particular case, nothing is highlighted on the chart. So if there was a therapy that we were suggesting, one of these rows would be highlighted. For both SG0 and SGU, if that's what spirometry suggests, none of these rules will be highlighted on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the chart. However, we do have a bullet point which stresses that if there are significant symptoms with SG0 or SGU, then more evaluation is needed because maybe there might be some options that are available that need to be pursued. Let's go back to the, uh, to the top and the cat again, if you don't mind, Ben. So let's do let's add some more. Let's do two for the first four questions and one for the last four. That gives us a score of 12. That's a little higher than accepted, so that's significant. Let's again click no exacerbations here. And now on the spirometry screen, let's go with 65, 65, 65. We're back on the interactive chart, and now this is highlighted SG1. That's the uh, spirometry gauge one. That's the mild disease. Uh, and if we go down now to that interactive chart, you see that we have highlighted a couple of rows. We've highlighted the spirometry gauge, we've highlighted the symptom row, and we've highlighted the importance in all patients with COPD of evaluating the comorbidities. In this particular instance, you need to remember that the pinwheels are the, are the sign of the foundation and they're viewed as, as first line choices, while the orange uh, buttons are the circles are second line choices. I think most of us, for patients with um, mild disease, let's go back a little bit, Ben. Yeah, so that should hit next. 
sorry. I don't want any, right? Let's go next, 65. This should go to SG2. Next. All right, so SG1, so that's mild disease. Now, if we go down to the to the chart, you see that we've highlighted the spirometry gauges and the regular symptoms. Most of us, I think, for this would use uh, either the uh, llama alone or potentially the llama lava, but for more mild disease, the llama might be a perfectly reasonable choice. All right, let's go back up again. Let's go back up to the to the CAT scoring. Okay, for this one, let's go with threes for the first four. Twos for the rest. If we're down, down, that gives us a score of 20, that's obviously quite significant. Let's go on, let's hit no exacerbations. Let's go next. And for this one, let's put in 50 for the vital capacity, 40 for the FEV1, 55 for the ratio. Now, if we hit next, that shows us SG2. So this is moderate disease. The explanation's above, and if you go down to that, uh, to that flow chart, we've now highlighted the moderate row, we've highlighted the regular symptoms row, and you see that we've now highlighted the oxygenation row. That doesn't mean that all these people need oxygen, but it, we are suggesting that for anyone with moderate or severe COPD, that the oxygen requirements be evaluated, because it's obviously an important concern. Once again, the pinwheel suggests the, the, uh, the, the primary option while the circles are the secondary option. I think most of us for this particular uh, severity of disease and symptoms would probably be suggesting using a llama lava as a first line choice of therapy. Uh, let's leave the, let's go back up again. Leave the CAT scores the same, Vin. So that would be fours for the first, threes for the first four, right? and then twos for the rest. Again, we have a score of 20. Now let's hit exacerbations. Let's change that. Let's hit yes for both of those. Let's go down. Let's again put in that 50, 40, 55. Now you still have highlighted the SG2, the moderate uh, uh, diagnose, definition, but let's on, go down to that flow chart, and you now see that besides the moderate and the symptoms and the oxygenation rows, you've now highlighted the exacerbation and high risk row. Uh, now there you have a number of options. You could potentially use a LAMA or a LAMA LABA or a LABA ICS or triple. The decision here would depend upon the severity of the COPD, the severity of the uh, and the frequency of the exacerbations. And in a case like this, the therapy chart uh, that David showed you before might help you decide which of those options might be best to use. Let's go back up. Let's leave the same CAT score and the exacerbation. Go back up just one screen, Dave. Let's get rid of those spirometry gauges, numbers. Let's assume, as happens far too often, that spirometry is not available. Now let's see what happens on the screen. You'll see on the bottom of the screen, if spirometry is not available, click here for possible therapy options. And if we click there, that actually takes us back to that therapy chart, which as David pointed out, you can use uh, with, both, with just the, the symptoms and the exacerbation scores. So you can use that to make, it, make some suggestions. One last time, uh, Vinny, let's go back to that cat one last time. Okay, let's do it for this one, using two for the first two questions, then four for the next three questions, and then two for the last several questions. And that gives us a score of 22, obviously quite high and quite significant. Uh, let's say no for the exacerbation questions. And let's do 40, 25, 55. And where does that take us in the chart? It shows us that this is SG3, that's severe COPD. And if we go down to the chart, you'll see that the, the spirometry line is highlighted, the symptoms line is highlighted, the oxygen line is highlighted, but in addition, the emphysema line is highlighted. Now, it doesn't mean these people have to have emphysema. 
It means that we're suggesting that you look for that on your CAT scan, in particular, since we now have some newer options available. Beyond lung volume reduction surgery, we have the recently improved bronchoscopic valves in people who meet the criteria. Uh, if, uh, if, and I, let's not go back because we've done this, I think, enough, but uh, I just want to give people a flavor. If on the CAT, uh, the first two lines are highlighted with higher numbers. Those are the bronchitic lines, if you will, of cough and sputum. Uh, then the bronchitic row would be highlighted. So it allows us to put together not just the symptoms and the exacerbations. It allows us to put together the severity of the, C of the COPD gauged by your spirometry uh, and puts that together to allow us to bring out with some of the CAT questions some of the other options that you need to think about. Now, if you've decided to choose to use the MMRC rather than the CAT score, uh, then you need to understand that by the nature of the MMRC, let's just look at that for a second, Ben. By the nature of the MMRC, there are no bronchitic, there are no cough, there are no sputum questions there. So you'll never be able to get highlighted uh, that chronic bronchitic row if you choose to use the MMRC. On the other hand, let's click number four on that. That gives you that score. Let's go no exacerbations. Let's go with the ones we gave before, 40, 25, 55. And that gets, again, to the severity of the COPD. And even though you've used the MMRC here, you can see that the emphysema row has been highlighted because you've, you've got the combination of pretty severe COPD uh, by spirometry with a lot of respiratory symptoms. Uh, I would suggest to you that, uh, that you guys play with this a little bit before you use it with your patients so you're familiar about what you can show. Uh, this is something that I would suggest that you could work together with your patients. So many patients now uh, feel that their doctors are spending most of their time working on a computer screen as opposed to working with them. This gives them an option where they can work together to try to define what the therapeutic options might be. Let's go back to the home screen for a couple of minutes, Ben, and look at some of the other options. Let's hit view more. That takes us to a secondary menu with some other interesting options. If you were to click the cat or the MMRC, I wouldn't do it now, but if you click the cat or the MMRC on this screen, all you'll be able to do is calculate the point scores for those. It will not trigger the interactive program that we talked about before. But as you can see, there are some other things here which might be of interest. Let's click on the Bode. As you know, this is something that Barcelli and his colleagues developed a number of years ago. Uh, let's, uh, it has four uh, uh, criteria, as you guys will remember. Let's hit 3649 for the FEV1. Let's hit 150 to 249 for the six-minute walk. Let's hit three for the dyspnea scale. Let's hit less than 21 for body mass index. That gives us a score of seven, and if you hit next, you'll be able to get a total score and an approximate four-year survival. So this will allow you to take your patients and give yourself an idea uh, of what their survival might be. Now, obviously, some of this might depend upon what your therapeutic options might be. Let's go back to that uh, that screen then, Vin. Let's go back to the uh, to the uh, secondary menu. Okay, there are other things here. Uh, we have the decaf, which is a hospitalized exacerbation score, which gives you an idea of the uh, mortality risk there. Uh, that includes the dyspnea scale. Let's click that. Let's go to the second box. And the eosinophilia, let's say no. Let's say consolidation, no. Let's say acidemia, yes. Let's say fibrillation, yes. If you look at those criteria, again, you'll get a gauge. Next. It shows the risk of mortality of your patients hospitalized with an acute exacerbation and suggests when they are high or medium or low risk. Back to that screen again, Ben. If we can go back to that highlight. All right, we don't have to show them, but there's also, you don't have to go back to this. Let's go back to that uh, that screen again, Vin. 
Okay. We don't have to show it, but there's an anxiety scale and a, dis and a depression screener, uh, which allows you to get a better idea of what your, uh, what these issues, which are obviously critical to your patient, might be. And finally, there's a pulmonary referral checklist, a, a mnemonic, if you will. Let's show that briefly, Vin. So this is called Help Out. Uh, it stands for hospitalizations, exacerbations, low lung function, problems sleeping, oxygen needs, uh, uh, uncertain diagnosis and therapy options. Uh, and it, the more of these that get highlighted, uh, the more you might think about uh, referring somebody to a pulmonologist uh, if you're the primary care provider. Let's go back to that secondary menu again. Okay, in the resources, we have some other things. We have special considerations, which basically repeats what we've had we had in the uh, in with the uh, with uh, with some of those bullet points. It has your access to the uh, to some of the other things you could get to from the screener. Uh, it has the Fletcher-Peter curve for a smoking cessation, and it has a couple of important links. Let's click on the links for me, Vin. So this will allow you, for example, to go directly to the COPD National Action Plan site, which, as you know, has been an important uh, uh, issue that, uh, that the NHLBI has pushed forward, uh, something that we all are grateful for and uh, provides a wealth of information for us going forward, including the national goals. Uh, there are also links to, uh, to COPD Foundation sites where you can download hard copies or, or order hard copies. Uh, of the My COPD Action Plan or the hard copies of the Pocket Consultant Guide. Back to that uh, that uh, sub-menu. Uh, if you look at uh, below, you'll see that there's a link to Praxis. Uh, Praxis is uh, the COPD Foundation's uh, online hub for healthcare providers. In the app, we can link you to two sections to Praxis. The Praxis Nexus, which is a blog of more than 80 posts, including best practices in improving care and reducing readmissions, and a resource repository where you can find over 200 toolkits or videos or research articles uh, summarizing uh, some of the issues like readmission reduction, improving education, palliative care, pulmonary rehab, uh, comorbidities, and more. The app will take you to the 25 most recent entrees for both of these resources. And finally, we have a link to the COPD Foundation Journal, uh, and you will be able to, to download and read uh, the most recent 25 journal articles that are provided. Uh, all of these, I think, are critically important apps, uh, uh, additions to this app. Back to that uh, for one last time. There is a support app that you can click which gives you a little bit of information, including be able to get to Kristen directly if you need to talk to Kristen, but also give you some, uh, some uh, suggestions about how best to use the, uh, the mobile app. Uh, I think I'll stop here. You know, I think that uh, this has obviously been something that many of us have spent a lot of time and effort working on. The foundation understands that the, work, that the app is a work in evolution. We will be able to track how often it's downloaded, We'll be able to track how often the different components are used, and we are looking forward to working with investigators to define ways to monitor its impact. Uh, the impact of the users, your impact, will be critical as we continue to work together to try to improve patient care.